The Self-Helpful Podcast is brought to you by Ziggler, your premier source for equipping life and leadership coaches. Visit Ziggler.com and let them inspire your true coaching performance. Welcome, everyone, and thanks for joining me as I talk with today's most important influencers, guides, and change makers to uncover what truly drives them and extract the big takeaway from their personal journey and their greatest wisdom. I'm your host, Kevin Miller, and this is Self Helpful. This is our peak wellness show where we give specific focus to our health and wellness, the foundation for all we do. In this episode, we look at the key way to give your body a break. If you've got a an old car, especially driven a car that was ever overheating, you know the only way to give it a break is to turn it off and let it cool down. I've had moving trucks and old cars in the past. They're overheating in the middle of the summer day and you got to pull over on the side under the shade and let them cool down. Our bodies in today's culture are almost always overheated, in essence, as they try to digest food, constant food, too much food, food our bodies don't like and struggle with. Even in our sleep, our bodies are generally toiling away trying to deal with food before the next time we put more food in. And we never give them a break. The term for this that nobody likes is fasting. I grew up with that as a religious practice, but here we're primarily talking about it from a physiological and psychological standpoint, as we truly believe it can be a profound tactic to use for your healing. Uh, we, talking about it, includes my co-host in the show, Randy James, medical doctor and functional medicine expert. And on that note, before you fast or take any of the counsel ideas, guidance that we talk about on these peak wellness shows, you of course should uh, look at, to your personal doctor. We can't give personal advice to anyone. We don't give personal advice. This is just general health and wellness concepts for you to consider. We have seen great results from fasting. I mean, if you have a chronic illness or a disease, fasting may be one of the best medicines possible. And I'll preface it by saying that I don't enjoy fasting. I mean, I've broken bones and I don't like to wear a cast to heal, but I do it. I've dealt with psychological issues and I've seen therapists that I don't enjoy doing, but I want the help. The topic today is not eating food for a prolonged period of time in order to enable the body to heal, to give it a break. Eating throughout the day from morning till night is something that humans have done only really for a short amount of time. A time where we've seen a lot of rise in chronic illness and disease. That's not the only reason. There's lots of reasons, but that's one of them that is suspect. Our bodies were created for and intended to get a break from food, just like animals do. In this episode, we discuss just this prolonged fasting. And you'll hear me address that. Again, I do not at all like to abstain from eating. I love to eat and I don't fast uh, super frequently. I do love to feel great, though, to perform at a top-notch level, and I want uh, to be devoid of aches and pains. At 52 years old and in the future at 92 years old, I want to think clearly and creatively. I want to be fully mobile and spry. I have no reason to give these things up, and taking times to not eat and let my body heal is paramount for all of this. You don't have to abstain for food for, you know, for 30 days. I sure haven't, but mere intermittent fasting is often just not enough to get the full benefits of fasting. And you're going to hear why. So here you go. Uh, the episode here that your taste buds and belly aren't going to want to hear, but the rest of your body may be starving for. All right. This topic today, of prolonged fasting is what I'm going to call it. It's your deal. But since I write the shows, here's my premise. All right. The premise is whatever. And I know you're going to hit back on it and that's okay. We'll do that. Whatever ailment you have, your ache, pain, impediment, handicap might be helped, probably will be, could even be healed and eradicated by fasting. Uh, now, and fasting being completely from food for a prolonged period of time on a consistent basis. Okay. That sounds horrific. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I want to talk about that too. But now, obviously, if you are handicapped and you lost a leg in the war, this is not going to help grow your leg back. So, uh, you know, obviously, but to the average American, you know, we now have, what did we say in the last show on this? The stat is 
Now, fifth, over 50% of Americans have at least one chronic illness and disease. I think it's 55% or something like that. 40% have two chronic illnesses or disease. So we're talking about these issues of obesity, diabetes, hypertension, you know, go down the list. We've done Parkinson's and cancer and all these things that they can be helped brought by prolonged uh, fasting. Now, what we're going to get into, what I want us to get in, what were we going to say? The answer is yes. Yeah, the answer is yes. Okay. Uh, is that we are absolutely addicted. I, I don't know. Let's say me. Kevin Miller is addicted to the, if it's fair to say, the dopamine of food on my taste buds. And what I've been thinking about, especially as I'm on this, you know, kind of vacation getaway is also just that feeling of a full tummy. It's, yeah. it's really good. <laughs> I really like it. But when we're talking about food, and I was thinking about this today, Randy, as I was thinking about this show, and we've talked about that you had a patient and you, you said, what, do you, what is your thought when you say the word fasting? And he said, terror. And I thought, man, that's pretty, because as I look at some of the stuff, and I know you've researched this so much, but look at that. When we talk about food, it is, I mean, for the span of humanity, that is survival. I mean, that is, if I don't eat, I might die. I might starve to death for, you know, again, the span of, you know, no, all time before right. us, not the past little bit, especially since the industrial revolution where we could have food anytime. And so we're still of that makeup. We're still of that makeup of food is, is kind of, I mean, that's what we do. And in today's world, and that's what you do to fuel everything. So I want us to be, I want to just be upfront with that. This is a, a, from emotional standpoint. I'm not a happy camper with this whole fasting thing, but over here on the, the, the healing side, I'm blown away by the stuff you've been showing me and the stuff we've been experiencing. So I'm hoping that's a good preface here. Yeah, my goodness. It's the, it's both the, the terror and the expectation that this is going to do something good. And, 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 you know, it will. And just today, new patients who are in that mostly kind of healthy category and ah, I don't need that. And it's like, well, yeah, no, you, you don't in order to not die in order to be a normal American, you don't need to fast. In fact, that's how to become a normal American is eat all the time. Yeah. So here we are back to the idea that for 300 years, we're still stuck since the industrial industrial revolution with the idea that food meant, Back then, now if you go back 500 to 1,000 years, food meant survival, food meant performance. Food, food was the requirement in order to survive and do the job and be able to do it again. And now, for at least since you know the 60s or 70s in America, it's, it's the other way around. There's too much food. But the emotional part, the social part, the genetic part, even, you know, it's of... of expecting food, wanting food, liking the full belly, the dopamine hit, everything that is wonderful about food. Uh, gosh, it's so hard for even you and I, you know, and that's where this year, as opposed to the last couple of years, I have so much more grace. I, I guess that might be the right word. So much more understanding and empathy for people that are just like, Oh, I, I, I just don't want to. So, uh, well, I do. Too. I, do too. I don't either. <laughs> and well, but to go to what you said, I mean, we are, I just want to realize that yeah, we are me. I am you or we are programmed that we have to eat every day. I mean, it is the answer for everything, for performance, for thinking, you don't have energy, you're, you're tired. And it's that perspective. And I was trying to come up with a better analogy and, and I didn't, Randy, maybe you do. Of You know, we looked at it. I looked at it as I'm a car, or I'm a, you know, I'm an engine. I have a gas tank you got to put something in there. If it runs out, you're, you're toast. And, and that's any malady that we have as a result of, well, you need to eat or you need to eat, you know, even, even the cold, you're sick. Well, you, you need to eat chicken soup. And yep. now, here we are. And we flipped it and go, gosh, you're sick. Don't eat anything is the best thing you can do. That is just so countercultural to the media, of course. And, and I was looking back and, uh, I was actually looking back at some of the history of breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And that breakfast, like in Rome, they didn't do breakfast. You just get up, go out, and you work. And then there are big meals in the middle of the day. And they actually frowned upon uh, breakfast. And then it was whatever his name is, John Kellogg, 
who yeah. came up with the idea. And this is during World War II that breakfast really came into uh-huh. light. And it's really when the start of media and propaganda, propaganda and the guy that I studied, Edward Bernays, who's the guy that during World War II, be, he helped smoking become a norm, made it sexy. And he brought smoking and he was brilliant. That's when breakfast came in. Now, people are going to hear this and, you know, it sounds so bad. It's conspiracy theory and, you know, these these skinny, you know, uh, radical guys are talking about this. But, man, to look at it, because ultimately what, what we're looking at is saying, okay, folks, if it sounds bad, have you looked at the stats on American health? It is diabolical today. We are killing ourselves. And now as you're looking at this, we are overfeeding and it helps me to look back on going, why did we come to this norm that shouldn't be normal? And you just said a minute ago, the normal American. I don't want to be the normal American that uh-huh. you and I have, are 50 now. And the normal American is not going to ski as you just did a couple of days ago. They're not going to ski. They're not uh, doing all these things that they used to do. And they're expecting cognitive and physical decline Right now, pretty much at this point, it's just kind of a slow thing. And we get to that point. I'm in Florida right now. Love it. Having a great time. It's a lot of old, heavy people who are moving really slow. I mean, I don't want it. I don't want it. So if you're listening to this show and you think that's okay, I don't know why you're listening to this show. If you're looking at that and going, no, I want to be the anomaly, which I have seen as well. And I've seen the 90 year old spry man and woman, very rare. And I, I want to be them. Why wouldn't I? So that's here we are. It this will be a good topic because it's it is it is so deep. And the norm in America is to be unwell. And even worse than that, when you then are unwell enough to go to the doctor, they're gonna measure you through the lens of how unwell you are. I was going to say, and of a, of a bar that's set really, really yeah. low. The bar is set at quote unquote average or normal. So, so like with this couple today where one, one of them was just so reluctant and I'm like, look, you, you have to let go of the paradigm that, that I'm saying these words as if you're sick. It, it in fact, you know, we live, um, just outside of Colorado Springs and there's a nationally famous, uh, hike called the incline. And it's one of those old cog rail things that just go straight up and it destroys your thighs, you know? So, you know, people who travel there, they just do it as a bucket list kind of a thing. And the, and the lady said, I'd like to be able to, that we were talking about, what are you going to define as true life? And she was turning 60 and she says, I want to be able to do it. So it wasn't about run a four minute mile or five minute mile. It's just do that. I'm like, okay, you know, over three hours or 30 minutes, like, you know, how fast do you want to be able to do that? And she's like, I just want to do it. And then you ask the question, can you imagine if you'd gone to your old doctor and said, I can't climb the incline. Can you fix me? Like we just don't think that way. The doctor would laugh at you and say, well, you know, go and climb it. And then when you're hurting that bad, we'll give you some kind of pill to make you hurt less. Well, or and, if you have a heart attack while you're doing it, we'll take care of you then. Well, and to your testimony, you're a doctor. How much training did you get to answer that question? Oh, zero. <laughs> it's just, just, so my own paradigm shift has been to no longer talk to people through the lens, through the paradigm of, of we're going to mark how ill you are and just shift that over to how well you can be. Or the words we're using a lot now are resilience and capacity. And that's the homework for people to do. Yeah. Well, that brings up today's topic is a thousand years ago. And I told the patient today, because he was kind of a buff athletic kind of guy who prided himself on his 60 year old skiing in his case. And, but when I brought up fasting, he's like, Oh yeah, no, I can't do that. (laughs) And I'm like, well, what if I said to you, Hey, you know, we're going to go skiing, but you know, you can't come if you have to carry a backpack full of, you know, food and candy bars or whatever, because you can't handle it. Right. So shifting it over to talk to Americans to say resilience is being able to do your normal everyday life on an empty stomach. That is resilience. That is metabolic flexibility. That is capacity. And by 
many, many markers. If we want to go back over into those pathological biomarkers, the person who can do that is by definition far less likely to have those chronic diseases that you started off talking about of diabetes and cancer and whatever. Well, the facts are there and, and we don't like them and they hurt. And I agree. So then it becomes this, this social game of, okay, how do we, how do we engage? How do we engage? Yeah. And I think about years ago, you and I talking about wine and we did a fast of wine and proved that, well, maybe it was prior to that. And you said, look, uh, whether or not it, it's, you know, I, I, I have any problem or not, which you thought, I don't think that I do. I still don't want it to, con- you said that, I don't want it to control me. Can I have a nice evening and a nice meal without wine? Am I that dependent upon it? And we talked about the same thing uh, with, you know, morning devotions and coffee and whatnot. And for that purpose, that was one of the motivators to abstain for a while, just to say, look, I'm, I'm going to prove to myself that it doesn't have control of me for one. And, uh, and two, that I can have joy without it. Well, so the same thing, because I think of so many, and I pick on guys, especially who are prideful uh, in so many things to say, we have proven, I mean, we, we know that we know, I think we could say this, right? That we do not have to have food. We can do without food. A human being <laughs> should be able to go without food unless there's something wrong. So a, a, a fairly well person should be able to go without food for what would you I mean, I know we can go extreme and say people have done it for 30 days, but the average, average, fairly well person should be able to go for what? What would you say? Three days without food and not have any big adverse. Yeah, I'd even go seven. They're going to, they're going to have, they're going to have, it would be kind of like, you know, taking a, an unexercised person and saying, well, when, if we say, okay, let's walk a mile or two or three, at what point are, are they going to be? Is there going to be a problem? Is it going to be at mile 9, 10, 11, 12, 13? I mean, at, at some point, sure. So that's a gray scale. But I would say it like this, that, look, you're not going to do any lasting damage or harm, even if you go seven days. Mm-hmm. So I, I just had to almost have a throwdown with a patient the other day who said, no, I, you looked at me like I'm crazy. You've got to be kidding. Like, I'm going to lose muscle mass. And I'm going to look somebody in the side and say, no, you're not. That isn't, that's what the culture thinks. And granted, if your goal in life is to be a muscle building, if you've got a competition coming up next week, okay, now's not the right time. We're not talking about that. But is it going to give you some kind of disease? Are you going to get a muscle wasting disease? Are you going to break down your lean muscle or your lean body mass? And you're not, you're just not. The, the data on, I mean, again, could there be one person out there that proves me wrong because their metabolic physiology is a little bit off or wrong or different? Of course. But for the average person, like you said, who's generally on the well side, you already can do this. But just like the guy who's been sitting on the couch, if I know he can walk five miles, he's not going to have a heart attack, but he's going to be really, really sore. Yeah. And so the person who's out of fasting shape, you're going to have some symptoms. And, and we'll talk about those today. Like it, it, it helps to understand, well, what can I expect as I'm training into this? Because then it, it, it's kind of like, you know, if a guy who's going from a couch to the 5k, if he starts his training regimen and let's say he does a half a mile walk or jog and he says, you know, it's really clear that God doesn't want me to exercise because it kind of makes me sweat and I don't like to sweat or my muscles get tired and I get short of breath and I'm get out of breath. So God is clearly telling me that my body is not built for exercise. Mm -hmm. And on the fasting side, people say, Oh, I get hangry. And in this case, the wife nudges him in the shoulders and says, Oh yeah. Do I have to be around while he's fasting? Yeah. I was like, well, that's a symptom. So train into fasting enough to train that aspect out. It, you know, what are, what are some of the other things you've heard? Too? I mean, I, I assume I've heard and I've even felt sometimes and it's probably because I'm doing something wrong. You know, I, maybe I feel a little bit lightheaded or, uh, you know, again, just something when you when you're so consistently. I mean, are there literal with a drug? You I mean, you're going to expect a withdrawal to some degree. 
yeah, I, we can, we can say the number one drug in America is sugar and a subset of that is food. <laughs> well, okay. So what you said there, would it be, is it fair to say, or is it correct to say that if you have a diet higher in certain things, sugar may be a number one, you may have more adverse effects, feelings from stopping eating. You know, so again, diet dependent, you, you may have more because your body sure. is more accustomed to that, that quick hit. Okay. Sure. Absolutely. The, so to the person who feels like they need to eat every two hours, they are going to likely be more symptomatic faster. And so my recommendation to them is to say, well, you know, just like if we talk to the guy on the couch, if he happens to be 400 pounds, it's, it's just going to be a totally different discussion compared to the guy who's at a normal weight and he's only maybe six months out of shape. Yeah. Right. So, so same thing. If we're talking to somebody who's never been past, you know, 12 midnight and 6 a.m. breakfast food window, then he's so out of fasting shape that we want to lean into it a little bit gingerly because, and you asked about the symptoms, um, I would say here they are. So hangry is probably number one. People say, oh, I just get irritable. I'm just hungry. And if I'm hungry and I don't get to eat, I'm just irritated. It's like, all right, that's, you know, Snickers makes the famous commercial. You're not you when you're hungry. Yeah. And that's true. Yeah. And that's pathology. <laughs> we have a whole commercial built on a pathological statement and, and, they're, and they're proud of it. And it's probably a good commercial, meaning people buy Snickers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So hangry is number, probably number one. And, and then two, three and four, are probably right there with it. People will get, and like one girl, 14 years old, said it the other day. She said, I get the sugar shakes. Hmm. I thought that was a pretty good word. Uh, so you, you start to get that shaky feeling like I just need to eat. And then right behind that, some people get nausea. Like I, you miss your eating window and now I'm nauseated. And now I got to eat while I'm nauseated to get back out of that. Um, number three would be a headache. People say, I, I just get a headache. Um, and then number four would just be uh, tummy pain. You know, I just, I feel like I'm in pain. My tummy's growling. I get this sense of hunger pain, P-A-N-G. Yeah. And, you know, most kids will call it a hunger pain. And uh, so all, all of those, I'd say, expect them. They're going to happen to some degree. And then, no different than if somebody's going to go out and go on a jog, I'd say expect to breathe heavy, expect to sweat, expect for your muscles to be fatigued the next day, expect to need to recover. That's pretty normal. And so the next layer down, and you and I talked about some of these when we did our longer ones, um, is uh, getting cold. That was kind of the thing for me is I had another blanket on at night and the, and the likelihood there is as I'm getting into day, you know, three, four, five, my fuel converting efficiency, getting into the deep freezer of stored glycogen of stored fat, which I don't have a lot of. So maybe that's also, should I not go that far? And I would say, yeah, I shouldn't go that far very often but I think I still should touch into those areas periodically. Um, so getting a little cold, it always does a number on your thyroid. So thyroid numbers will be abnormal as you hit three, four, five days. Another thing that I had, your electrolytes are gonna go abnormal as well. And I think not, not because that's what fasting should do to you, but because I was out of fasting shape, so then hit day three and my ankles would swell. So if I'm going to do a modified fast, I'm going to add electrolytes into my water. And I'm, my hope is that, that I, as I hit 55 and 65, that I could do a three to five day fast and not have those things happen. Yeah. Meaning I'm more metabolically resilient. So those are the, the things that as we coach people into this therapy of fasting, expect these things plan on them 
And especially those, those top four, what I tell people to do is say, okay, look, especially as you're training into it, um, don't have super important things to do. Like don't have a job interview or, or, or something like that. Maybe it's a normal work day or a normal Saturday. For me, it's easier to fast on a busy work day. Yeah. But I give myself grace that if I feel yuck, then you're able to, and I would say, okay, take 15 minutes, drink a glass of water and lay down. Just go lay in the sun, go, just go lay down. Just re relieve yourself of responsibility for 15 minutes. And almost every experienced faster will say it's, it's a wave of a symptom. And, and it's kind of like, my, am I imagine, you know, being stuck in the ocean as the tide's coming in. This yeah. is a terrible thought. But if your feet are stuck and a wave goes over your head, you're like, all right, I know the wave is going to go back down again. Just hold your breath for a while. And then and then, and then it passes and, and you go back to work. And almost I'd say almost everybody says after they accomplish, you know, and in my office, John, uh, your family, also people would say after hitting day two or three, they'll say, gosh, that is not as bad as I thought it was going to be. Yeah, I thought it was going to get if 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 my normal six hour i haven't eaten for six hours i have a hunger pain if that's at a level of here then 12 hours must be here and 20 hours must be here and it just gets worse and worse and worse and it does and it, those pains actually just dissipate which is exactly what the body's designed to do it's not well, designed to eat well and i like what you said a minute ago you called it an exercise and i hadn't even thought about it in that reference point but i like that to look at if i'm going to do a three-day fast that's that is an exercise. I am doing a, a physical endeavor and there are going to be ups and downs. If I went and did a marathon, I'm going to have, you know, mile here and man, there's a little ache and pain. And I got through it, and man, this mile, I got a cramp and I got through it. So I like the idea of this is an exercise. This is not to, this is not to make me feel great in the moment necessarily. This is a long-term benefit. I'm trying to achieve a a goal. And, you know, on that, Randy, I want, I want to, I do want to back up a second because we're, we're, and have you, we're talking about prolonged fasting. We're not talking about it. And I, or I'd like to back up and say, weight loss may be a by byproduct, but for the moment, let's take that off the plate. Let's take weight loss off the plate and let's take spiritual off the plate. I grew up in the church, just like you. And any talk of fasting was just some Jesus spiritual thing. And if we take that off, because what we've been talking about as we've done these shows and hitting on some of the primary chronic issues like Parkinson's, like diabetes, like cancer, is fasting keeps coming up over and over and over. And so you've been studying this. You've been re reading, you know, Jace, uh, Dr. Jason Fung, uh, who, who, just for some quick resources on, on this, Dr. Jason Fung, and he has, uh, what is it, that di diabetes, the what are the um, diabetes code? The uh, no, no, code? not diabetes. So diabetes is the word from Mark Hyman. Oh. Um, but the diabetes code oh. and the obesity code. So his first book was the obesity code then diabetes code and his last one, the cancer code. And so he's kind of the popular guy for sure. Well, he, he is, but you've got some other ones. Dave Osprey, the bulletproof coffee guy is he either just came out with one or he's just about to. Yeah, he just did. I just saw it's called uh, Fast This Way. Okay. And uh, Jason Fung also wrote uh, The Fasting Lane, um, mostly written by his team. So the dietitian or, you know, the nutritionists that are helping people to work through this. Uh, Peter Atia, he hasn't read the book, but, you know, he's got a podcast. So he's another guy that's done a lot of the research. And the other big researcher is Walter with a V, Walter Longo. Uh, L E N G O. So an Italian guy who's now at the university of, or USC, I think in uh, Southern California. And he has made famous the fasting mimicking diet. All oh, right. So that you can even purchase his diet, right? Like this is, you pay a lot of money for a little bit of food, but right. for sure, this particular diet has been studied and is proven to do these things on average in people yeah, with regard to certain biomarkers and that kind of thing. And the idea there is for people who just cannot imagine eating nothing. Well, here's a way to have a meal 
but it's a fasting mimicking meal um, built around five days a month that you would do for three months in a row. So that's Walter Longo. I forgot the name of his book. And if anybody Googles or goes into PubMed and puts those names in there, I mean, oh, another one is uh, Goldhammer, Dr. Goldhammer, who is the uh, head guy at True North Hospital. So True North now has one east one west coast where it's kind of funny so these people go to a hospital so it's a hospital and you pay a lot of money and you go there you be in a room and you just don't eat minimum seven days maximum 40 days so it's like (laughs) just don't eat now of course they're these are sick people and they're watching their vital signs and stuff like that and and it's kind of funny because you go to the hospital and you don't eat but every day there's a cookie class <laughs> and there's a nutrition lecture and there's the exercise. It, the data coming out uh, from Goldhammer and our pretty miraculous stories. I've had two patients over the course of the last 10 years that actually went there. Uh, both did more than a 20 day fast and both said never felt better. Yeah. And then the trick is, but then I went back to normal life and I, and if this is where you and I are, is how do we incorporate a rhythm, a lifestyle of fasting? And, and maybe even a better word is I'm working on my relationship with food and with fasting. Well, or back to or, or go to the root issue, like you said before, of I'm working on my resiliency. I'm working on my health. I'm working on my uh, the guy you talked about. Dr. Longo, the longevity diet. Is that uh, right? uh, or intuitive, intuitive fasting? Is uh, Will Cole. Okay. Intuitive All right. Fasting. Point being that there's, you know, as we continue, I think, to see these more and more rise in chronic illness and disease in America, now we're seeing people get the idea or get the message that we're overfeeding and that this fasting needs to be a part of it. So you took, let me, let me say something there. Um, cause I think for your, our generation, so we're early 50 and let's say, and above, so our parents and then below us is going to be millennial Gen Z kind of thing. Right. So for late forties and fifties and above, One of the things that's in our consciousness, do you remember the biosphere experiment? In uh, Tucson or somewhere in Arizona. Yeah, that's right. I saw it. it. You remember the pictures of those guys? Uh Look like concentration camp dudes, right? Uh Look awful. And they all came out of there saying, yeah, no, we're done. (laughs) So here's two points to make. There's no doubt about this statement. If you said, what's the one thing if we imposed on all humans that would lower chronic disease and increase vitality and longevity of life, the one answer we can say categorically is calorie restriction. Mm -hmm. But nobody can eat that way. Nobody can, because also once you normalize, let's just say you go to 80% calories and you do that for 10 years, well, does then, do you have to drop down another 20% to maintain calorie restriction? Like where do you stop? Yeah, Calorie restriction, doesn't work in the real world. If by real world, we mean people with families and going to work and go on a vacation and people that get off the wagon train and all of that. So in the real world, now, if you, if we forced it, if, if we were all in jail and you calorie restricted people, they'll be better. Like we can do with rats and mice, but you can't do that with humans. So, but does it work? Absolutely. And we know why it works, but it doesn't translate into the real world. Nobody lives that way. But you and I can come along and say, man, I, I like wine and chocolate and coffee and, and, and those things enough that I want to fast from them sometimes so that I can enjoy them appropriately for the next 30 years. Mm-hmm. And we need to just put food in the category. So I like food enough that I want to learn how to fast 
to be resilient so I can eat well and increase my resilience and capacity over time and have confidence in that direction. And, but I'm not going to calorie restrict forever. I know that, but I can periodically just not eat. Well, so let's, let's I, talk, let's talk about that because I mean, you said I like food and my thought was I like performance. Um, I, I want to perform well and everybody's got their level of what that means to them. Just like you said, the lady who wants to go up the incline, which I think is like a 2000 feet and a mile or something like that. It's, it's just steep steps. Does she want to do that in 30 minutes, which I about annihilated myself <laughs> to do it in un, just under 30 minutes. I think the average is probably, you know, what hour, hour and a half or something like that. Or does she want to do it in three minutes? Depends on her performance, but I mean, so many of the folks that come to you for, uh, uh, as patients and to some degree me as well, I just want to feel good. I do not want to feel bad. And the, the weller, as Dr. James said, the weller I get, the more sensitive I am to feeling bad. And I want to feel even better. I want to feel, how do I want to feel today? Perfect. I want no aches. I want no pains. I want no brain fog. I want to be, I'm here on a, a, a t- now I'm on a writing getaway. So tomorrow I want to wake up and I want to have full capacity, as full capacity as possible of my brain. Critical thinking, creative thinking. Uh, I, I want all that. To, I don't want to wake up tomorrow. I don't have any list that says, okay, what deficiencies are you okay with tomorrow, Kevin? I don't really want any. And so... How, how much brain fog are you okay with? None. Uh, uh, right. Yeah. How much chronic joint pain and how much... Okay, I've got another cultural... Uh, this is probably a sign that I watch too much TV, right? Um, so uh, I think it's Geico. You know how Geico has these goofy commercials that lead you astray and have nothing to do with whatever. Okay. But it's the one where they're 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 trying to teach middle aged people to not be their parents. <laughs> okay, and and I, I kid you not, Kevin, because we've talked about this. And uh, so the teacher is kind of standing there, you know, with a critical eye and uh, and the student who's a slightly overweight kind of middle aged guy. He sits down and he goes, oh, and the guy and the teacher looks at the class and he goes, did you hear it? Did you hear it? It's like, do you hear your parents? Oh, my God. And then the guy comes on. (laughs) That's my gosh. That's brilliant. I don't want to grow. You and I talk about that. We are 50 year old males, American males. We are supposed to, I'm supposed to get up off this couch right now. And I'm just supposed to do that. Right. I'm just, ugh. I mean, it's just a habit. We see it on TV. It's what it's, it's, it's a cultural phenomenon. And I think why? I, and then my ki- our kids, what do they do? Boom, gone. But we just have ex- bounce, right? yeah, just bounce with no thought. And, and then was, we'll, you know, and then there's always the, the anomaly uh, cause it's not normal anymore. And then a 90 year old, uh, guy or, or girl that can do that. I mean, it exists, but we just say, Oh, that's just, that's just good uh, genetics. That right? It's just lucky. Good just, genes. Yeah. Just lucky. And, and again, we're not being, I don't want to say we're not trying to, we're with all compassion towards people who have had, you know, been victimized by things and have things, but most of us are victimized in America by ignorance. We just don't know. That's the point of this show. It's the point of everything that you yeah. and I read and we're students of trying to eradicate our own ignorance. There's another question, Kevin, how ignorant are you, do you want to be tomorrow? I, I don't <laughs> want to be any, but I know I'm going to, I have no idea how ignorant I am. It's dramatic and I'll be learning till I am, till I am 90. Well, but to look at this, you said a relationship. Well, I don't know. I, I, we talk all the time, but you know, the relationship with, with fasting, with calorie, what did you say? Calorie depletion? Uh, the, calorie the, restriction. Restriction, yeah. right. You said that we can't do that all the time. Now, you have just taken a group of people, and I started late in the game with you guys, of doing, uh, in essence, three days a week, but it was actually longer than that. You actually went to 84 hours. I want you to explain why that, but you had them doing that, have them doing that for 90 days, and then that was the end in essence of the exercise. So I joined you guys later in the game and did it for uh, five weeks or, or maybe I hit my six week before I I went on vacation now and I'm not doing it currently, Uh, but I'll get back on that. But then it was ongoing. What am I going to do? And I think my decision is that ongoing and I'd like it to be the rest of my life 
that for the most, for the most part, if, even if you go with the 80, 20 rule, 80% of the time I eat Sunday night and I don't eat again until Tuesday morning, 36 hours. So that's calorie restriction, but that's one day a week. And it did make me, you were talking about something earlier. And I thought about back in my pro cycling days. So when we're in race season, which right now would be race season, I would, Monday would be a rest day because we did a big day, you know, a race the day before we may not ride at all. Or if we do, it's going to be 10, 20 miles, super slow, no exertion for the most part. It's recovery Tuesday based on our recovery, how we felt it was uh, a specialization sprints, hill repeats, something like that. Not too super long. Wednesday was LSD long, slow distance. So it might be three hours, five hours, whatever. It's just endurance riding, not super hard. Thursday might be, or if we're going to race on Saturday, it's two days before it might be a rest, a kind of a rest day again, kind of like a Monday Tuesday was, uh, we usually do something just a real short, not too taxing, but just wake the legs up, make sure that we're not going to be rusty. Saturday and Sunday is just full on out, you know, racing. So that's what we did. Well, here I am with food and I have breakfast, lunch, and dinner and snack every day. Every week, every month, every year. I, why don't we back to your thing of cycling or having seasons for certain foods? Season. Why do yeah. I not have a season for I eat? Yeah, you know what? Sunday, Saturday, and Sunday. Man, I usually eat a lot. It's family. It's festivities. I eat a lot. So on Monday, I just yeah, I just don't eat. I give my body a break, just like I did with cycling. You know, Tuesday. Now I want to make sure I get a lot of vegetables. I'm just thinking this. I'm thinking out loud now. How oh, great would that be? Tuesday. Man, that's vegetable day. I'm going to eat nothing but vegetables. Tons of vegetables. You know, Wednesday, that's the middle of the week. I'm going to have a glass of wine and maybe something good, you know, tonight. Not too much. It's the middle of the week. You know, Thursday, whatever, Friday. Now, Friday's getting to the weekend. Friday night, we're starting Fiesta. We're starting uh, Mardi Gras now, man. This is the weekend. And then Monday, I'm not going to eat. I, I'm totally, why, why not? That, that may be something it's, interesting to, to think of. It is. Uh, it's uh, it's cross-training. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Couple of points on what you just said. So I want to distinguish calorie restriction from fasting. Their calorie restrictions means you still eat all the time, but just less. Which would be intermittent fasting. No. Calorie restriction means you sit down to a meal and eat oh. less. Oh, okay. So you still eat all that. Right. 80% right. Okay. of your calories, but you eat all the time. Well, or, and there's or, the dieting effort that's obviously that, that yeah, that's killed that's us. that's that's what, you know, everybody says, I need to lose weight. Well, you should eat less and exercise. Yeah. And how is that working right. for us? And, and it just, it utterly fails. And there's actually a lot of studies looking at the uh, biggest loser and why all, except for one, to my knowledge of those guys gain their weight back wow. and over 10 years. <clears throat> and so, so calorie restriction is a different idea from fasting. Fasting means there isn't calorie restriction when you eat. But there are periods of time, intermittent fasting is within a day, and then prolonged, like you said, is more than 36 hours, where you don't eat anything. And, and so that's what you just described. And then this idea of cross-training and how that's good for the muscles, where Tiger Woods needs muscle memory for this golf swing, right? Like he doesn't care about his tennis swing. But in general, for longevity and health and all that, if you're not a super subspecialty athlete, you want to, you know, you want to cross train. There's going to be right. endurance. There's going to be stretching. There's going to be weights. There's going to be hinge movements. There's going to be planking movements. All of those things you would never say, well, the best exercise is planking. Number one, it's what you'll do. But then after that, if you'll do all of these exercises, then we'll do all of them. Yeah. That's going to equal even more resilience and capacity and, and well and an overall if we're going to say what's a, what's the best overall athlete it's a crossfit it's, it's the it's the well who's who do we call uh who do we what's the title um fittest man or something uh, no well no it's who who gets the title of the greatest athlete alive decathlete yeah the decathlete well he's going to get smoked if he goes up against any specialist absolutely yeah and so, but I, we, I've always had a, a special place for that decathlete guy. Cause it's like, I think <laughs> there should be another title because I can't do anything in the decathlon, but I could beat that guy in ping pong Well, and I yeah, could be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, even as a pro cyclist, um, one of my closest friends who was on the national cycling team, 
then he went over to be a triathlete and man, my, my reverence for, for him (laughs) as an overall physical specimen went up, man, he could, overall, he was amazing. Now I might, you know, best him just in cycling, barely, you know, as a specialist, but that he could do all that. He was much more physically able. Yeah. We as pro cyclists in the off season, we go play racquetball and we're destroyed the next day because we don't use anything, but the exact same, you know, uh, specific muscles every day. That's, that's, that's right. My, uh, my brother-in-law, you know, 30 years ago was a division one football player. And this is when he was dating my sister. So I was home from college or something and we're going to go out, you know, go over to the Y and, and so we're just kind of goofing around and we're going to play racquetball. So we go in there and, and he's not good. Like he's a, he's a division one athlete, but he's not good at this sport. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm bored out of my mind. And so I'm like, all right, well, let's, let's at least try to get some good kind of exercise. So for five minutes, just don't ever stop hitting the ball. And of course, I'm the brother-in-law or almost, right? So there's no way he's going to quit. Yeah. But he, I find out from my sister later that he was destroyed <laughs> for that, for that very reason. Yeah. And we need to be able to do the same thing over here on the food side to say, look to the, <laughs> like Kevin, we could say, you are a subspecialist athlete in, in eating dark chocolate. You're yeah. great. But you will be an even better dark chocolate eater. If you can put in days of fasting in a row and a better wine drinker, a better hamburger eater, I mean, whatever. Mm -hmm. If you can also do this, that by definition will translate into more resilience capacity. You'll be able to have a much wider variety of enjoyment. And I, I don't even want to call it splurge, right? Like I don't want to fast you and I personally are not going to fast so that we can go enjoy McDonald's, yep. right? Like that, that's not us. But like you say, we've upgraded our appetites over here and they're, and they're special. Yeah. And I want to be able to do that. Same with physical. Uh, we do the same thing in relationships, right? Like, like um, there is a, even within a marriage, you, you, you don't have date night every single night because that would be weird, right? Then it ruins date night. Yeah. Um, so by the same token, we, we see this all, this is how we budget. We save for vacations, but we don't do that all the time. But somehow in America, like you said, you know, for 50 years in a row, I ate three meals a day. It's the answer for everything. Any, it, anything physiological, psychological, the answer is eat something uh, of that. And, you know, just on what you said about splurging after this period of consistent, prolonged fasting, I am more reverent with my food Um, on this vacation. If there's, you know, some little snacks or whatever, you know, the airplane is the worst coming along with their little bag of not food. I'm like, no way. There's (laughs) no no way I'm going to waste my appetite on that crap. <laughs> I'm going to have something good. And I end up putting off eating until I can have something yeah. good. Uh, I, I like that piece of it. But, you know, on this, Randy, I wanted to pull out that we have, and you've seen patients do it. So you've seen, again, you know, that, that we should as a, as a people, as humans, be able to fast. Let's just say, let's go with the three days. That's what you had people do. And at the end of the third day, so the third day, so Sunday nights happen didn't eat Monday, didn't eat Tuesday, didn't eat Wednesday. And we're not going to till Thursday morning that on Wednesday afternoon, my mind is as good as ever. I mean, there's, there's no, there's not only no detriment. I I feel better. I feel more alert again, going back to critical thinking, creative thinking, all those kind of things. Uh, And uh, so mind is, is great physically. I can go for a run. Now I do feel, and maybe this is still because I'm not as healthy as the fast as I could. I don't feel like I've got super output. Like I wouldn't fast for three days or five days before my mountain bike race. I, I think I do feel like I don't have, I don't have the, 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 the push, the power, the whatever, but physically I can, I can still do anything. I can jump off, off the couch and do my work and I can go for a run and I can go with the kids and play soccer and whatever. I can do that. And, and then it brings it down to realizing, yeah, I do not need food 
Have I ever been hungry? I can never now say I'm hungry. All I can say is, man, I would really like to eat. I, I am right. looking, tonight. I am looking forward to eating. I'm looking forward to eating here in the next hour or two, even though I had so much sushi this afternoon, I couldn't finish what I did. And I've got that in the to go thing, but I want to eat. I am not hungry. And if I don't eat for next three days, I'm still really not literally hungry, but emotionally. <laughs> That's it, I like where you said that it's increased your reverence for food. It's increased my, not empathy, but reverence might be the right word for when you and I were growing up, it was, you know, the, the phrase of, of, you know, you're not hungry like you're in Ethiopia. Yeah. Right. Starvation exists in the world and it's a bad thing. And what those guys are going through, I, I can't call what I go through hunger, oh. right? It's, it's inconvenience. It's I'd, I'd really like to eat. I'd really like to have a social time. I'd really like to feel my belly full and I feel really empty and all those things. Um, I have reverence for food to the point where, you know, McDonald's and Burger King are just not on my mind ever. And when I first started this, I used to look forward to the airplane snacks. And now it's not a second thought of saying no, thank you to the, you know, pretzels or whatever. I mean, goodness gracious. Um, because, and I, and I like, so Kevin, the, for, for people to understand emotionally that we're not talking about weight loss and diabetes and these kind of things, it's mindset. And, um, maybe even a little bit deeper than that, a soul set, a reverence, that's a great word for, for food, for the gift of it. And it changes the dynamic of, of all of that. And it, it's, it doesn't feel like deprivation. I don't let it feel like that. Well, and there you, it wasn't it you that talked about the difference of how we would f- literally feel, even knowing that it's psychosomatic, I guess, but how we would feel if somebody came along and said, Randy, we're not letting you eat for three days. Yeah. We're in a jail cell and we're going to starve you for three days. Man, you're pretty quick. You're feeling like crap. It's a different feeling when you're surrounded by food, you're choosing not to. So granted, you know, there's that, but on the emotional side, the thing that I want, that I feel like I want to be, I talk about compassion is the aspect of this prolonged fasting. I did not, I have not been in it and come to the point of on day three going, you know what? I feel like this peaceful, reverent shaman on a mountaintop. I no longer need food. I am still struggling with, I do not like not eating food. Food gives me, I I derive joy from it. I know my taste buds like it. I know my belly likes it. My mind likes the celebration of that. Even the reverence. I want the glass of wine and the music and the cook and the shop for the food. And I mean, I like all that. I don't get that joy. Now I may have another joy. I may be feeding another appetite like my one for, for health and wellness overall, but man, that joy that I, I, I love loving, I don't, yeah. get, I don't get, and I don't like not getting it. And I don't know that if I fasted for three days a week for the next year, that at the end of it, I would, I would be used to it. I would have grown the muscle. I don't foresee, and maybe I'm kidding myself, but I don't foresee that I would go yet. Yeah, I actually look forward to it. It's fun. No, I, I think I would still say, no, it's more fun when I eat. I agree. I, I, I would never, I wouldn't think that that would be out there. I think you and I are still kind of newbies in this whole fasting experience. Okay. okay, Yeah. That I I could conceive of that being a muscle, but am I willing to work hard enough to get that kind of a muscle? I don't think so, but I, in my, as my journey on this pathway started in my mid twenties, in my mid twenties, it was, it was a big, I keep mentioning, uh, you know, Burger King because it was such a, me and me and my guy friends like that was tradition. We loved it. Mm-hmm. It was same day, same time, same place. We talk. And, and then to stop that felt terrible. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and it took us, you know, me in my case, getting married, moving away and all that kind of stuff to, to, to go away from that. But I never would have said 20 years ago that when I'm 50, I'm just going to be happy to not be going to Burger King anymore. Well, that being said, um, yeah. 
I, I do. I think we're actually in, in a place where not many people in American history have ever gone to this other place to yeah. where it, it, it became the norm. No, you think of the, you know, kind of the, the Asian Eastern medicine type thing. And yeah. uh, the, the, the maybe the old, like you said at the beginning, we think of monks. Yeah, exactly. You know, in a monastery the, and the yogi, the whatever, and it's yeah. a spiritual enlightened thing. And they have done away with all pleasures and maybe that's, that's what it, it seems like. <laughs> and I am not about to do away with my pleasures. I have no intent or desire to do away with my pleasures. If anything, I want them to pleasure me more. Like you said, I want to, if I maybe abstain so that I enjoy the wine. I, I haven't yeah. been, I've been drinking less wine and I am in, I, when this is over, I will be taking a, a bicycle with a basket on the back to the wine store to get a, a bottle of wine and I'll be uh, a mile further on the beach. And I'm going to watch the sunset with a, I am going to revere that sip of wine with a sunset. And there's no way I would, I would change that, uh, trade that for watching Jerry Springer with a case of beer. Are you kidding me? I'm not, no way. I'm going to upgrade my appetites and upgrade the appetite. So I don't want to be that guy who has, and I, and, but, but I want to put that out there because I think we get that when you put fasting, it's like, Oh, you're enlightened, getting rid of the pleasures, man. No, not at all. And the biggest thing I struggle with still is I don't like denying that. I don't like in the moment denying that pleasure, but for a greater good, a greater appetite, which is my health and wellness as a 90 year old guy. Yeah, I'm going to make this part of my continual exercise. Yes. Thank you, friends, for joining us on this journey to elevate our own experience and improve the way we show up for others. If you want expert guidance in fasting and your overall health, I would say connect with my co-host, Dr. Randy James. You can find him at truelifemedicine.com. People from all around the country come here to see him and consult with him. So go check it out. If you appreciate this podcast and want to share it with others, please rate the show on Spotify. Uh, leave us a review and a rating on Apple. You can subscribe on YouTube, and watch the full episode of, of anything we do here. And you can follow me on social media where we do a lot of great clips, give you little previews of the shows and sometimes just all you may want from a show. Uh, just find me at, so, at uh, social media at Kevin Miller CO. And if you want to learn how to master your own inner drive, get my book, What Drives You on Amazon. Till next time, stay driven. <laughs>